These teachers are just about to land in Antarctica, the coldest, windiest, most extreme continent on the planet. It's absolutely incredible. Stepping off the plane, see the mountains behind, and then it's that way, just space, as far as you can see. But they're not coming to teach, or even for a holiday. They're coming to perform scientific experiments, which will contribute to our understanding of Antarctica, and at the same time, they'll be investigating what effect living in such harsh conditions has on the human body. Antarctica is the most southerly point of land on the planet. It covers an area larger than Australia. The continent is constantly covered in a layer of ice, and the lowest temperature on the planet's surface was recorded there at minus 89 degrees centigrade. It's also very windy, with cold air rushing downhill from the South Pole, out towards the coast, often at over 100 kilometers per hour. But why do people want to come to a place that is so hostile? Because no one lives there, Antarctica is almost untouched by any man-made influences, such as car exhausts and pollution. This means that it provides a relatively unspoilt place to do science. One of the things which is key for any science experiment is control, is knowing what your variables are and being in a position to control them. And in Antarctica, you've got such a pristine, simple environment, largely unaffected by human activity, except uh, sort of at a distance. So it's a very clean environment in which to do science and to find out things. Because so few people have been there, very little is known about the plants and animals that live on the continent. Because of this, one of the experiments the teachers are doing in Antarctica is to look for lichens, tiny plant-like organisms that live on rocks. By looking at the ecosystem of Antarctica, they plan to assess what effect global warming is having on the plants and animals. Despite the teachers' expertise, they quickly find this isn't the same as doing science back in the UK. Because they're so tiny and because we're not very familiar with, with exactly what species we're going to find here, the problem we've got is identification. Different colours on the rocks, different minerals could be lichens. So we've collected a few samples that, because we've got a little bit of doubt, we're going to wait till we get back to camp and have a look at them. And I suspect over the next few weeks another problem is going to be just trying to get our eye in as to exactly what type of habitat you're likely to find them in. That hunt for the habitat proves trickier than they had predicted. We often walked miles and didn't see much, and it was often surprising where we did find things. So we'd go to an area convinced that there'd be nothing there and then find things, and we'd go somewhere where we were sure we'd find something and see nothing. It was very difficult to predict exactly where you might find your samples, and you really just had to hunt and look around. To prepare for the hostile Antarctic climate, the teachers went to Norway to test out their science on a glacier. They wanted to test out their methods of finding lichens in less extreme conditions. It's a moss. That's probably, <laughs> that's probably quite realistic. This feeble little bit of growth is probably a fairly realistic idea of the sort of thing we might find in Antarctica. So we've got a, little, a few mosses growing in the rock here. Once they've found the lichen, or moss in this case, they have to catalogue where it's found. Then they take a small sample back to the lab to see if they can identify it. Their trip to Norway has enabled them to identify some of the factors that they're going to have to look out for when they do the science in Antarctica. Here it's practical to open your coat and stuff your notebook down your jacket, but in Antarctica probably not. You're not going to be wanting to undo zips, anything. And here we're quite happy to waggle cameras around and you know, keep them outside for a long time with no protection on. In Antarctica the battery will just drain instantly. Yeah. Dealing with such tiny samples that these gloves that we were thinking of using, we just can't manipulate our fingers well enough to be able to even open the bags or get the samples in. Everything's like you're trying to do it on space or something. It's all difficult. 
Back in Antarctica, to increase their chances of discovering lichens, the teachers go deeper into the mountains. Now, 60 miles from base camp, they take everything they're going to need with them for three weeks in the mountains. Here we are on the Henderson Glacier, and just before us, you can see our camp. And what I am going to do is to show you the view from our toilet, which is quite impressive. So let's back in. So this is what you see from our toilet. Uh, quite amazing. The teachers begin to look for lichens in the new area, and they have to look in some challenging places to find them. It isn't long before their efforts pay off. So here we've got um, some of this foliage, the red lichen, the rusty red one, and also a small amount of the other types of lichen that we've got there. So there's two different species on that rock. Um, hopefully when we get back to the UK, we can get someone to have a proper look at it and just make sure they identify exactly what it is and just find out whether it's, it's anything new. During three weeks of searching, the teachers slowly learn where the lichens are likely to grow. You need to find a region, firstly, where the rock's exposed. So usually this is going to be sort of vertical surfaces, but it also needs to be very sheltered. Um, so it will usually be deep in the cracks in the rock and also needs to be in a situation where the rocks will be warmed sufficiently for there to be liquid water. With their samples carefully logged and collected, they set off to find more lichens. Minus 12.4, 0.5 wind chill. To help scientists understand how the body adapts and reacts to being subjected to extreme conditions, the teachers are also doing an experiment studying the effects of cold on the body. To do this, they record the team's fitness and well-being twice, once before the trip to Antarctica and once afterwards. Here the team are being tested before the trip. They are tested for the amount of fat in their body, their general fitness and for their ability to feel and respond to cold. This test is a cold injury test. It's the cold injury vasodilation test. So it looks at the blood flow and the temperature of my middle finger on my non-dominant hand when immersed in cold water uh, for 20 minutes. So the idea is to see how good my body is at reacting to cold, essentially. The idea is that they're trying to measure the, your maximum oxygen uptake and you cycle on the bicycle for, it usually works out about 12 minutes or so, and every so often they keep adding more weights and basically you just keep pedalling until you can't pedal anymore. The tests are run by Professor Mike Tipton. Um, what often happens um, when you go on expedition is actually people get fitter because they do more habitual exercise during the course of the day. However, this group have been doing so much training and so much aerobic training that they may actually find that they detrain a little bit in this capacity. Now they've been tested, the team have some baseline data from which to work from. When they come back from Antarctica, they'll be tested again to see how their bodies have changed. One thing that's likely to be affecting the team's physical well-being is the food. For ease of use, the bulk of it is freeze-dried. We've just added water to the chicken korma and we've left it for five minutes and this is the end result. So let's have a taste. Try not to spill it. Pretty good. But there is a second part to their experiment. They also want to see what effect the weather has on the team's mental state. The teachers record the temperature and wind speed every day, then fill in a questionnaire about how they're feeling in the evening. This is a, a mood state questionnaire. And it goes through things like, did I enjoy today's meals? Um, how depressed or happy am I? How lonely am I? How alert? How physically feeling 100%, etc. After one week, the teachers are stuck in a storm. 
The weather is so bad that they can't even go out of the tent. Pretty much throughout the night and all day today, we've had winds that have been gusting up to about 30 knots. It's meant lots of digging out of the tent, and it's meant an awful lot of noise and rattling of the tent through the night and through the day. The bad weather appears to make the teachers feel depressed. Can't have a wash. Everything smells. It's just a bit. All this data will be useful for scientists to look at, to understand how different conditions affect psychological well-being. After one month, the team returned to Britain. Their science finished. Now they have to collate the data. It's really nice to be back. It's been quite a long journey back, but um, I think everybody's you know, really sort of glad to see friends and family, get a lot of, lot of really dirty washing <laughs> sorted out. The teachers come back to Portsmouth University to be retested, to see what effect the cold has had on their bodies. Some people's thermal sensitivity has changed, that means their ability to feel changes in cold or changes in heat. So my fingers are less sensitive than they were, whereas someone like Ruth is much more sensitive than she was. They've found that there's been a, an increase in weight, and that, that weight's been put on in fat around the stomach, which uh, looks like the body just trying to beef itself up a bit against the cold. One of the group comes to the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. So they've, they've all been kept as cold as possible for as long as possible. It is hoped that the biologists there can identify the lichen the team have collected. It's the first directed biological collection that I'm aware of from this area. So in that sense, it's extremely valuable. Um, it's a, one of the biggest mountain ranges in the Antarctic. And other than a few specimens that geologists have collected and passed on to us, we have no real knowledge of what occurs there. The samples will be recorded and put into the vast catalogue of data kept at the British Antarctic Survey. With the experiments over, the teachers have time to reflect on what they would have done differently while collecting their lichens. So I've done a sketch of the glacier and where I, where I found them. I think I would probably prepare sample bags and notes in a, in a systematic way before going out into the field so that what I had were things that I could just fill in, photograph and, and do that in an absolutely routine way. I think I, I sort of changed my mind two or three times as I went through collecting samples and thought, oh, I'll do it this way or that's slightly better than another. But I think now I, I would be able to refine that to a particular technique and do that much more systematically than I did before. I didn't think it was a disaster, but there were little, little refinements which I think would make it work better next time. Uh, you've got lots of facts about Antarctica. I need to turn those into pictures. The teachers back in their schools in England will never forget their time in Antarctica. And they hope that their research will contribute to our understanding of Antarctica and of the planet as a whole.